Today we have two items on our Committee of the Whole agenda. The first one is Parks, Recreation, and Natural Areas Update presentation. So with that, we invite our Parks Department to come up and speak. Good evening. Thank you, um, Council President Pro Tem, uh, City Council members, for providing us the opportunity to present to you this evening. My name is Leslie Betlock, the Parks Planning and Natural Resources Director, and alongside me is Erica Schmidt, our Capital Project Coordinator, and also the Project Lead for this planned update. Also, I believe they're joining us here this evening. Uh, nevertheless, they're part of our project team from Community and Economic Development, Angie Mathias, Long Range Planning Manager, and Katie Google Morales, our Assistant Planner. So I'd like to start the presentation off with a planned overview about why this plan is so important to the city. It's really the blueprint for our system. It improves livability, enhances economic development, facilitates new, improved recreation opportunities and habitat protection, and is instrumental in promoting a healthy community. And we do this by assessing and predicting the current and future demand and need for recreation facilities and services based upon population, demographics, and participation rates. Once adopted by Council, we submit it to the State Recreation and Conservation Office for certification which allows us to apply for and receive grant funding from other outside sources. So it's instrumental in the city to leverage city funds. Well, I'd like to call your attention to this photograph on the slide, which is um, the former Hillcrest Elementary School in North Highlands Park and Neighborhood Center, uh, which is now the site of uh, Meadowcrest Accessible Playground, and we'll see a much better photo later in the presentation. So we take a coordinated planning uh, approach with the Parks, Recreation, and Natural Areas Plan with our high-level planning documents, such as the Citywide Comprehensive Plan, companion plans such as the recently adopted Trails and Bicycle Master Plan, and uh, community-level planning documents as noted in the slide. The city has a rich history in uh, planning for its parks and recreation system in Renton, with the first plan being adopted in 1978, followed by plans being adopted in 1984, 1993, 2003, and the most recent in 2011. So on this slide are the vision and the seven goals from the adopted 2011 plan. And in 2011, there was a shift of the more detailed policy language from the citywide comp plan to this particular plan. We will be revisiting this policy language to ensure the language reflects the public's desired future direction as we move forward. I'm now going to address some of the changes that we've seen in Renton since the 2011 plan. In our department, we've had an internal reorganization and an effort to better serve the community. Our department has also added the neighborhood program, which is growing quickly. The number of recognized neighborhoods has grown from 72 in 2016 to 103 in 2019. Our organization is changing, and so is the population that we serve. This slide shows a variety of trends that date back from 1990 to the present. Uh, the key metrics that we'd like to highlight are the population on top and the bottom is level of service, which is park acres per thousand residents. The data shows that the level of service is not quite keeping pace with the growing population. And so for the takeaway from this, um, we'd like to call out that the population is growing faster than our park system. So what this could mean is increased impacts with more people using the same parks. Our community has changed in other ways. Although despite a growing population, our age distribution is largely holding steady. 
We have roughly the same percentage of residents under 18 and over 65 today as in 2000. However, our population is increasingly diverse and increasingly non-white. The top languages spoken by students in Renton schools today are English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. With a growing population, there's always some challenges. And for our city, what we found is that a growing population means staff is taking on more. We have one example of that in the urban forestry manager who managed 13 contract landscape maintenance sites in 1999 and now manages 52, the same position. The number of special event permits is also growing. Uh, it grew from 28 in 2010 to 48 in 2018, a 71% increase. Since 2010, the Community Service Department special events has added nine new events, not including neighborhood program events. So we've been increasing what we do. This graph shows population and level of service. You might recognize it. It was also presented as part of the Parks, Trails, and Community Facilities Initiative, also known as the Com Community Advisory Committee. And what we're trying to show up the, is if the population continues to grow, our park system will soon be below the city's adopted level of service. So again, this just means that there's going to be increased use of the existing parks and increased wear that leads to maintenance. This is a system-wide view. It doesn't look at geographic equity, but that's an important piece of the plan update that we'll be looking at moving forward. So we'd like to reflect back on accomplishments since the last plan was adopted to highlight how this plan is utilized to move the city forward in parks, recreation, and natural areas planning, acquisition, development, partnerships, programming, and leveraging city funding. So this is that better slide uh, of the Meadowcrest uh, Accessible Playground. Uh, this was completed since the last plan, the former site of the Hillcrest Elementary School and North Highlands Neighborhood Park. You can see there's no fence down the middle. It's one huge, fully accessible playground. We completed our first formal soft surface trail within uh, the natural area, May Creek. This trail was entirely funded with outside uh, resources. There were no city sources used. We replaced the 50-year-old Riverview Bridge. Uh, that too was entirely funded with outside resources. And we have a significant regional trail connection which will begin construction later this year to connect the city of Des Moines, SeaTac, Burien, Tukwila, and Renton from the Sound to Lake Washington. After nearly 30 years, we are nearly there in securing all our easements to connect the Cedar River Trail to Coulomb Park, otherwise known as the Sam Chastain Waterfront Trail. We acquired 40 acres of land along the May Creek Corridor. This has been a 30-year interjurisdictional program between the cities of Newcastle, Renton, and King County. And we dedicated phase one of the Sunset Neighborhood Park in June of last year and hope to begin construction for phase two, the final phase, in the summer of this year. We uh, also acquired a parcel of land to expand Cascade Park and acquired a second parcel of land to connect Cascade Park to Tiffany Park, which was identified in the adopted plan and reflected in a concept plan as well. We've revamped events and programming. We administer grants to the community for improvements, which builds neighborhood relationships, which also builds a stronger community. We have a five-way partnership for youth ages 5 to 14, known as STREAM, Science, Technology, Recreation, Environment, Art, and Math. And that five-way partnership, which has been formalized, is between the City of Renton, the Renton School District, the Environmental Science Center, TechBridge Girls, and Central Rendu. The plan also identified a new community park and community center in the Benson area and to also identify partnerships. The Family First Community Center fulfills all these needs. There's multiple coordinated planning efforts, both interdepartmentally as well as within the Community Services Department, as noted in this slide, which creates a broad, high-level, coordinated vision for the city. The plan establishes the framework for the city to pursue and meet standards of excellence. One of the key elements of this plan upon certification is the eligibility to apply for grants. 
for planning, acquisition, development, major maintenance, and recreation programming. And then, as you can see, the city was quite successful in receiving outside funding to leverage city funds. The key item that we heard from the public as part of the last public outreach process was developing partnerships to leverage city funding. The above slide is a sampling of formalized partnerships that are a result of the last plan update. So we have quite a few successes, exciting projects and programs, new leadership, grants, partnerships, awards and recognition. But we also have some challenges. The population continues to grow faster than staffing, park development and programming. Our level of service, acres per thousand, is declining. And of course, we will always have major maintenance, which is ongoing. Next, I'm going to share the key elements of this year's plan update process. We're expecting about a one year time frame for completion and there'll be a range of community engagement opportunities including committee input, open houses, workshops, online participation, and a statistically valid random household survey. I'll provide more detail on the inclusive engagement strategy in just a moment. This updated plan is going to build on the success of the 2011 plan and other planning efforts. However, we're gonna add some new elements this year. New elements include a natural areas evaluation tool that'll help evaluate the priority areas to focus restoration efforts. Infographics, which will distill complex information into a visually engaging manner that we find really connects with the public. And concept plans will be developed or updated. That's another element of the 2011 plan that really made a great connection with the public. Leslie just reviewed some of the highlights from the 2011 plan, which has worked really well and has generated a lot of successful projects. So for that reason, we'd like to bring forward some of the key elements from that plan that led to that success. Those include the decision-making tool, funding strategies, concept plans, and the cost model. And these are all tools that help focus resources on projects that advance our community's goals. I'd like to highlight a couple points in the process. Um, we're gonna pursue an inclusive engagement strategy. Previous outreach methods didn't yield participation that was representative of Renton's diverse population. We need to innovate to get different results, so that's what we're planning to do. The goal of the inclusive engagement effort is to hear from community members that are underrepresented in previous public outreach efforts. So we're going to meet people where they are, there'll be small informal meetings, familiar settings with known and trusted facilitators. So we're gonna use this opportunity to build capacity uh, and work with the mayor's inclusion task force. So three inclusion task force members will participate in a training and they'll conduct a total of four community conversations at key points in the process as a way to connect with communities. Mr. Chair, Ms. Wichi. Yes. Uh, um, can you explain better how you're planning to connect with multiple communities? I mean, what is your plan to go to them or? Yes. yes, so we're going to meet uh, with the inclusion task force and solicit volunteers from that group. And um, then they would go and have community conversations with groups that they're already members of in their community is the idea. Um, so that it might be a familiar place if they're in a part of a community group, if there's, if there's a neighborhood group or a community association or a, a church group or something like that. Um, it's gonna depend upon who volunteers. They'll know better than we do who their network is, but we are going to utilize those relationships that the members of the inclusion task force have in their communities. Thank you. Let me see if I understand correctly. We are gonna ask volunteers to do an outreach for the city? Yes. Okay, thank you. Some of the themes that we're gonna explore with this process include um, trends that impact our parks, recreation, and natural area system. Event, the number of events, staffing levels, land availability, major maintenance needs, and the funding landscape outside and within the city. Next steps include open house meetings, of which there are three. The first one is this evening, uh, Thursday, at 6 to 8 p.m. at the Renton Community Center. We're also gonna have online engagement for each open house for people who can't physically make it to the open house, so they're still able to participate. 
We'll also join you for three more Committee of the Whole briefings as we move through the process. And you can keep up to date with the project using our project website at rentonparksplan.com. And we'll be briefing the Parks Commission on March the 5th. And before we turn it over for questions, I just wanted to show you the interactive map that people can use to drop pins in the community to tell us about parks they like, the reasons they like them, barriers they've encountered that keep them from using parks more, or ideas they have for improving the system. So you can drop pins for each of those items if we wanted to talk about Kulan Park, and then you can answer a series of questions. So that continues for um, ideas and barriers so we can really get a, a geographic sense of how people are using the system and how they'd like to see it improved. And with that, we'll return and invite any questions that you might have. Thank you, nice job. Thank you. What's the time frame on getting the plan updated? We're expecting about a one year process. Any council members have any questions? Um, you already have the first community, the first open house, right? It's on Thursday, this oh, week. Okay. I thought that you already had it. I was going to ask you how did it go. So, withdraw my question. <laughs> we'll you. tell you next time. <laughs> <laughs> And I have one question. Um, will you be leveraging the outcomes and recommendations of the community advisory committee that we recently convened um, and apply that to any updates you're making to the plan? The uh, community advisory committee uh, recommendations were primarily related to our major maintenance six year capital improvement uh, plan. This plan focuses uh, more on planning acquisition development we do we will roll in some of the major maintenance not quite to that level of detail mm -hmm. and then the recreation programming in natural areas if i could piggyback on that the leslie and erica are doing such a, a great job and some of to your question some of the uh, gaps that were identified um, and the community efforts that were identified in the cac uh, process will be used that's part of what they'll be taking a look at and I also wanted to just double back a little bit on your question, Councilwoman Perez, um, with regards to the what we're calling volunteers out in the community. So they're still, for the inclusion portion of it, a diverse, uh, trying to get more diverse um, information back. Um, the team's still going to be doing our normal outreach with the surveys and as much as we can get out to the communities. Um, our consultant and other area um, cities and plans have utilized this strategy. So it's a way, like Erica was explaining, to get out a little bit deeper in the communities where if we were going and saying, hey, come to the senior center or come to an area that they might not be familiar with or comfortable with, by talking and um, experiencing these um, kind of outreaches with, with their community um, and gathering some information or at least the comfort level of getting out to, to at least get their word out and what their wishes would be or their concerns, challenges, um, that's just one other level of reaching out to that portion of the public. So I just wanted to clear that up. Madam President. Yes, Mr. Prince. So, Kelly, thank you, because I was going to say, sitting in those CAC meetings, they did mention stuff besides the major maintenance. Yes. So I'm glad that you guys are going to look at those gaps that they mentioned and utilize that as part of this plan as well. Yes. Collected a lot of good data, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A lot from the original plan, which is what 2011 plan, which is a lot of the information came from and what we evaluated. Well, thank Madam, you very much. M Madam Chair, oh, one more. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kaylee, for that information. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned just about um, the outreach into the, our diverse demographics, especially people whose language is their second language and they have a d different culture. Um, but I'm hoping, I, I'm waiting for the first open house because that is going to show us if the outreach is working or not. So let's see how are the demographics and from them probably we can work out on if, if we are not getting to our uh, diverse uh, communities to participate, how can we make sure that their voice is heard? So if, if I may uh, clarify, so um, the, our three open houses will be uh, similar to the open houses that we uh, did for our last plan update in 2011 and uh, also similar to what we did with our Trails and Bicycle Master Plan. And in that typical open house situation, uh, we do not uh, typically have a diverse population attend, which is why we're using our inclusion task force training uh, members, uh, three, two, 
two members. Three Tra members. Three members. Training three members to do outreach to different communities. And so it's, it's a targeted way to reach out to diverse communities as compared to the standard, let's have an open house uh, approach. It's in addition to the open house approach. We will have um, translation services for Vietnamese and Spanish at our open house meeting. Uh, those are the top two languages spoken at the Renton School District. Um, we ha will have uh, uh, translation on the website for also Spanish and Vietnamese, but this is, this is spe specifically trying to reach out to a different community. Mr. Prince had one more question. Yeah, and I know we've got to move on because we've got guests here from Metro. Uh, but my question, we keep talking about this meeting on Thursday. We've got an audience here, folks that are possibly watching. What time and where is the meeting at on Thursday? Go ahead. Oh, it's at the Renton Community Center from 6 to 8 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. And, then and Mr. Madam Foreman? President, yeah, I just, so I just wanted to get clarification, and, and perhaps you said this in, in uh, the presentation, but... Um, this, like like all of our long long term plans here, is sort of the blueprint, the vision, as we go forward for the next 20 years or or longer, right? And one of the things I wanted to say about that is that for anybody listening tonight and anybody that comes to the open houses, that um, you know I just want for them to understand that this is this is like our our dream vision for how we would use our natural areas, where we'd like to add parks and and so forth. There's we don't have the funding figured out for this, and, and people that show up at these open houses shouldn't feel constrained by the funding. It, it, if, if something makes sense, we want to put it in the plan, and then we'll, we'll seek opportunities, um, seek help to, to try and fund what we can and prioritize. Do I have that correct? You have that absolutely correct, and um, thank you. And as part of our last plan, you may recall, we had $256 million worth of projects proposed as part of the plan. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was a great way, as you can see by some of the accomplishments of uh, applying for outside funding resources yep. and leveraging city funds to get some, not all, of those projects mm -hmm. accomplished. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I could say one last real quick thing. I know we've got guests here, too, just to make sure that, um, again, the team is doing a really great job of trying to make sure we're reaching out to the um, the groups and the community that we haven't been able to get to before so that through social media with the uh, Vietnamese the Spanish um, is in um, has been out and posted so we're hoping that they will come to our uh, community meeting as well as in rent reporter and a lot of other avenues as well so we're doing a lot of different um, strategies to get people there so just wanted to follow up with that thank you thank you, thank you. next up we have the King County Metro rapid ride eyeline introduction and uh, Mr. Zimmerman will introduce our guests. President Witchie, members of the council, good evening. I'm Greg Zimmerman, Renton's Public Works Administrator. Uh, as you know, King County Metro Transit, through its Metro Connects program, is working on future planning uh, and for expansion of the rapid ride bus rapid transit system. So today we have with us Hannah McIntosh, Metro's Rapid Ride Program Director, and also uh, Metro Dave Vanderzee, uh, Metro's Renton Kent Auburn Area Mobility Plan Project Manager, to present information about Metro Rapid Ride I Line, which will be serving Rent, Kent, uh, uh, Kent Renton, and um, Auburn area. So Hannah and Dave. Great, thank you. We're just um, getting the presentation pulled up here. Well, I was going to start by thanking you all for your patience with the multiple reschedules that happened during the, the snow event, but I might be thanking you for your patience right now as we get this presentation pulled up also. All right. There we go. Presentation being pulled up. So. Uh, thank you, Greg, for that introduction. Again, I'm Hannah McIntosh with King County Metro. Um, I am the program director for the Rapid Ride program there. I'm joined by Dave Vanderzee, who is our project manager for 
one component of this uh, Rapid Ride Eyeline effort. And again, with the, all the snow events over the past two weeks, we ended up with briefings um, stacked up tonight here and in Auburn. So you're getting half the team, but I hope we will do the project justice. So thank you very much for having us. Um, do you want to, next slide? So before we jump into the details of the Eyeline project, I wanted to talk just a little bit about what Rapid Ride is and why we are so excited to be here tonight um, talking about this investment in the city of Renton. So Rapid Ride is a robust arterial bus rapid transit system. And when we talk about bus rapid transit, we are talking about a rubber tire transit system that brings with it a significant level of capital investment. In many ways, we like to think of it as a bus system that looks and feels and operates a little bit more like a train. And the idea is that with that capital investment that gives it really a permanent and a fixed feel, um, it drives investment, it drives economic development, it can drive land use and um, other, other kind of bigger picture community development things um, of that nature. So there's a permanence to these, these transit investments that will look and feel a little bit different than um, a standard bus route. Um, we like to think of it as something that adds value and stimulates growth. Um, specifically, we think of Rapid Ride, and can I just ask, has, it, has anybody here ridden Rapid Ride? They're the, the red buses, I'm seeing some nodding, some, okay. So we think of it as the best of Metro. Um, it has our highest quality services and facilities. Today, it carries about 20% of our daily ridership throughout King County, so um, 78,000 daily rides today. Uh, it is actually right up there with how many people are riding Link Light Rail today, um, although you might not know it. It employs really state-of-the-art innovations. I think the place you see that on the initial wave of rapid ride lines that went in starting almost 10 years ago was with real-time information at the stops so people could see when their next bus was coming. It just, it kind of puts your mind at ease to know that there is a bus coming and you know when it's gonna be coming. Um, it has, and this is a really important one, it has the highest level of speed and reliability investments of any of our service. So these are the things that to your average rider are not always gonna be visible, but they are there in the way you time your signals, in the way that maybe you give the bus what we call a queue jump, so it can jump out ahead of traffic at a signal. Um, really those things that keep the bus competitive and attractive for, for riders. Um, our goals for Rapid Ride are to have a 20% travel time savings, but measured at least five years after it goes in over the routes that it replaces. So people will have at least a 20% faster trip, um, hopefully more. And we've seen a 50% increase in ridership when you compare it to existing routes. So um, for instance, the E-Line that runs up Aurora in North Seattle now, um, carry, gosh, I might not get these numbers exactly right, but it's around 17,000 people a day. Um, so these are just, they really are carrying a lot of people around our region. Do you mind? Yep. So two years ago, Metro came out um, with the Metro Connects vision, which anticipated a very ambitious expansion of our service throughout the county, and also really represented a doubling down on Rapid Ride. We see Rapid Ride as one of our most successful products, and there's a high level of demand for it throughout the county. Um, and we are excited to be bringing this to Renton. So Dave, if you don't mind, one more click ahead. Yep. So the vision came out in Metro Connects about two years ago, and then um, it was our job to really map out the implementation plan. So we had the vision, and then um, just as we heard in the parks presentation just now, you do your vision setting, and then you map out what you can fund and how quickly you can put it in place. And the initial plan for rapid ride expansion in the King County Capital Improvement Program is outlined at a very high level here. 
And there are a few points I want to make with this slide. Um, the first one is that you will see the eye line in the very early years of implementation. So we prioritized projects according to a few different um, criteria. We looked at, for those of you who might be familiar with our service guidelines, we anchored in our service guidelines. So we looked at productivity of existing transit <coughs> routes. We looked at ridership of existing transit routes. We looked at geographic balance throughout the county, not, you know, we can't just invest in one part of the county. We looked at um, eagerness and desire to partner from uh, the jurisdictions that would be served by a line. And then we also looked at equity considerations. So we gave higher priority to projects that served lower than average um, minority community, census tracts with minority communities or low income communities. So you see the plan, the plan here. Um, Retina is already served by one rapid ride line, as you know, the F line. The I line here coming in 2023. The long range vision in Metro Connects had an additional, does still have an additional rapid ride line serving Renton that would connect Renton to Overlake. Um, that third line that would serve Renton is a strong contender for that last programmed line in 2027. You see it says an east or a south King County line out in 2027. We, 2027 is a long ways away, and so that line will be programmed when we update the capital improvement program again um, at the, in the next biennial budget cycle. The other and the last point I wanted to make before I hand it over to Dave is that we are excited about partnership um, with your city. Your staff has already been um, great, engaged, enthusiastic, challenging partners on this, and we really appreciate that level of engagement, that level of staff, um, support, and partnership. And I wanted to make the point, you know, there are a lot of projects here, not a lot, there's a handful of projects you hear and that you see here that are planned for the city of Seattle. And the city of Seattle comes to the table with a certain type of partnership. They passed a very large transportation levy. Um, the H line is a great example where they're able to bring tens of millions of dollars to that project in the Delridge Avenue corridor. Um, the H line though provides a really great example of another way to partner, which is the city of Burien where um, that project terminates in the South. The city of Burien does not have tens of millions of dollars to bring for capital investment for the H line but they have partnered with us very actively on grant applications and we together have secured $10 million in regional mobility grants for that project. They have been um, enthusiastic partners around really thinking critically around how right of way in the city of Burien can be used and dedicated to transit. Um, they've helped with the public conversation and so I just, I really like that H-Line project because it provides a great example of the different ways that we can work together to make these projects a reality. And that was everything I wanted to okay. say. I'm gonna hand it over to Dave. Thanks, Hannah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so my name is Dave Vanderzee. I'm the uh, uh, project manager for one piece of this project, as, as Hannah uh, mentioned. There's a couple of different pieces going on, and I'll just kind of talk through uh, how we hope to get from where we are today to an I-Line implementation in 2023. So. Uh, one thing about the I-Line is that it's not a route that exists today in sort of a one-for-one -one upgrade. So where Metro in the past has had routes that uh, were already in existence from end to end that were upgraded to rapid ride, the I-Line is really sort of a composite of pieces of the Route 169 and the Route 180 today, uh, which uh, have about 6,000 daily riders. It's in the top 25% of some of our most productive and highest ridership routes in our uh, non-Seattle uh, service area. Uh, we know uh, we have a high proportion of uh, Orca Lyft users, which is our low income based fare on the Route 180. Um, another reason that we looked at, the I -line, looked at this I-Line alignment is due to its connections to sound transit, uh, other rapid ride connections, connecting it to the, the frequent network, our frequent system. Um, and really looking at uh, how this feeds into a larger transit network. Uh, we expect uh, to look at $120 million of capital investments 
uh, along the corridor. And what that looks like is investments at the rapid ride stations. So one thing that comes along with uh, rapid ride is not just a, a bus stop with a, with a simple flag, but enhanced stations with passenger amenities, real-time information. Um, as Hannah mentioned, also looking at those speed and reliability investments. Some of those investments that may not be visible to the customer customer but really make the service perform well so things like those queue jumps um, bus only lanes uh, other signal timing improvements uh, we also look at uh, our access to transit access to the rapid <coughs> so kind of thinking about the passenger's journey from where their where their origin is to the stop and from their destination stop to where they're going so really kind of thinking about the whole trip and what sort of capital improvements uh, are needed for that um, so we expect this funding to come from a few different places, uh, including uh, grant partnerships. We have a partnership <coughs> that's in already in place, uh, looking at local funding uh, from King County uh, and additional uh, funding application uh, for the F uh, with the FTA. So you'll see on that graphic that we expect to apply for a small starts um, application in, in the fall of 2020. So getting from where we are now to um, service in 2023, we have a couple of big milestones to get through. Right now, we're in that red arrow in the planning phase, and we'll expect that to go throughout most of 2019. Where we get to uh, late 2019, early 2020, is that preliminary design phase and start doing some preliminary engineering with uh, the goal of having uh, an application in the fall of 2020, where we, I, I should also mention, where we expect to get to at the end of 2019 is a preferred alignment uh, for the I-Line. And so we have that preferred alignment that goes into our federal application for the FTA Small Starts application in 2020. Um, in 2021 through 2023 really is when we're, we're turning over dirt and building things on the ground and actually building out an eye line and getting things ready for service to start in 2023. And one thing that I'll mention that's not on this timeline but I'll get into uh, in the next slide here is uh, the Renton Kent area, the Renton Kent Auburn area mobility plan. So this is another project and sort of an interim step um, in the I line process. And that's sort of what creates the route that becomes the I line. So as I mentioned, the I line right now is made up of segments of routes 169 and 180. And so we are embarking on this process to do a number of things. Um, one is just to respond to other mobility needs uh, in the area. We know that uh, service, uh, metro service has been a bit, a bit static for the last several years. And so as mobility needs have changed and travel patterns have changed, we're trying to take a holistic look at the transit system, not just um, the creation of the I line, but looking at sort of mobility needs across uh, a wider swath of South King County. Um, this project in particular will have a focus uh, on uh, underserved populations and having a really uh, a focus on an equity focused uh, outreach approach and really understanding what the impacts to uh, to our vulnerable populations are as we make changes to the system and also ensuring that we're getting all the voices as part of our planning and outreach process for both the mobility plan as a whole and also gathering that feedback for the I line uh, in addition, we're also just focused on making improvements to the network as a whole. So thinking about what do we need to do to uh, respond to different uh, changes in ridership patterns? How do we increase ridership? Are there other parts of the system that aren't performing well from a, uh, a reliability standpoint? And again, kind of thinking about that whole network, that whole suite of changes that we can make. And, and again, lastly, as I mentioned, one, re one result that we'll get uh, with this plan is a new route that will then be upgraded to the I line in 2023. So we expect this plan, this sort of first phase, to be implemented in September of 2020. So following that table, that uh, arrow below, where we are right now is we're about to launch in our first phase of public outreach. So we're, 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 we're moments away, we expect in the next few days to launch our outreach process for the Renton Kent Auburn Area Mobility Plan. It's kind of a mouthful, so I have to make sure I'm saying that um, slowly. Uh, we expect that process to run through the end of the year and really focus on getting that in front of King County Council uh, in the spring of 2020. Uh, they'll look at that, they'll vote on that as a certain part of our service change process uh, in the spring of 2020. Uh, we'll use the summer to come back out and inform people about what the what the changes were that were approved 
And then uh, we look at September 2020 as the beginning of this new change. And so we'll, we expect changes to a number of routes, including the creation of, of this I-Line alignment, setting us up for 2023. The other thing uh, that I want to note is our integration with other projects going on in our study area, and particularly here in Renton. So one thing I just want to point out too that Melba Slackowitz, who's in the audience today, she is the project manager for the Renton Access to Transit study. Um, so that was a study that was commissioned through a proviso by our council. Uh, and so that's also going on uh, throughout this year and is expected to wrap up sometime this fall. Um, and so we expect Melva to come back and uh, offer some more information at a later date on uh, some details on that presentation, on, on that project. Um, and then a couple of other notable projects in our, in our study area include uh, coordinating with Sound Transit's I-405 BRT, so working very closely with the future implementation of that project. Um, we also have a, uh, um, a community connections project uh, within Renton on the, in the Benson Hill area. So ensuring that we're coordinating uh, with that project and that sort of rolled into the Renton Kent Auburn area mobility plan. Uh, and then additionally coordinating, make sure, making sure that we're coordinating with both the city uh, on any sort of roadway prep projects or other capital improvements and also our partners at WashDOT and we kind of think about uh, any opportunities where there's a road project that we might want to, to build off of for another capital improvement that will either benefit Rapid Ride uh, or any of the number of other uh, routes in the study area. So where we are right now is, as I mentioned, that we're about to launch our first phase of public outreach. So we're looking at a three-phase process. That first phase that begins in the next few days will just be sort of a needs assessment phase where we go out and listen to the community, gather information about what's working well with the transit system today, what's not working so well, understanding how people are using the service, in particular for the island, how people are using the Route 169 and 180 today, and really taking that feedback, taking that back, uh, at the end of March and, and really looking at how do we develop service concepts around that. Also presenting a couple different alternatives for people to consider for the I-Line alignment and having them weigh in on where, the, where their travel needs are. We come back out to the public in a second phase of outreach and that's really coming out with two different service scenarios. So really presenting them with some choices based on the feedback that we got, we got on phase one about uh, some choices that they uh, have for changes to the transit network and also an alignment that includes um, a representation of the I-Line. So we'll, we'll work on that through the, the summer months in June and July, take feedback from that phase and come back with a third and final phase where we really kind of move forward a preferred concept. And that preferred concept would be a, a single transit network with changes uh, in our study area, uh, and additionally with a, uh, you know, a final preferred alignment that we would use for our federal application to the FTA for the I-Line. So that, that process is, is expected to run through most of 2019 and really set us up to begin that uh, application work uh, for the, the I-Line throughout um, 2020, but also, again, moving us towards changes to the uh, transit network as a whole for September of 2020 in preparation for the I-Line. So that's where we are today at a very high level. As, as I mentioned, we have a couple of different uh, components. Uh, so we have Hannah here, uh, my contact information for the Renton Kent Auburn Area Mobility Plan. Greg McNett is our I-Line project manager. Uh, and Robin Austin is our uh, community outreach specialist who's really handling a lot of the outreach through, for both the Renton Kent Auburn Area Mobility Plan and I Line, which we really see as sort of an integrated joint project. So I think that leaves us a few minutes for questions. Uh, if you guys have any questions or comments. Thank you very much. That was very informative and, and needed, and we appreciate your coming out here and giving us that update. Uh, before we move on to questions, though, I did want to acknowledge that Council um, Member, County Council Member Dave Up the Grove is here in the audience today. And he was instrumental in making sure that the county budgeted for our rent and transit access study. So we wanted to thank you for that. And uh, I think we might have some questions related to that as well. So does any other council member have questions? Ryan, <coughs> Mr. McIrvin, I'm sorry. Uh, not so much a question. <laughs> well, first, I, I do also want to echo that thanks to uh, council member up the Grove for being here and for supporting that. Uh, funding for the Renton Transit Access Study. I, I certainly want to say I look forward to hearing those results uh, in the fall. Uh, would be curious in the, I guess, in the interim if we, uh, 
I don't, I don't want to guess because that's why we're doing the study, but to see how that will guide um, and if you think it will be helpful in shaping our integration, as, as you said, uh, in, with the rapid ride service uh, here in Renton. Uh, also curious, too, on uh, the, that future pr expansion and how it would integrate with that potentially uh, to over, like that was mentioned, the, 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 the longer term uh, one on the slide that you showed. Well, I think certainly for the longer term, we're well positioned to take into account the results of any, you know, study that happens over the course of this year or the next year. Um, and that definitely will help inform that prioritization process that we go through as that final line gets named when the, the county budget is updated in the next biennium also. Um, in terms of integration with the Mobility plan or the eye line? Yeah. Know, Dave, if you want to take that. I, I think um, there's definitely an opportunity to take advantage of the access to transit study uh, in terms of how we plan uh, other changes to the transit network. Uh, also, in that needs assessment phase, as we understand how people are using the system today, how they're accessing it, that's going to be very valuable information uh, that will, will really feed into some of the concepts that we develop as part of the mobility plan. So, we're working very closely with coordinating with Melva and that plan uh, as we as we go forward because we do think we're gonna get some pretty valuable information from their efforts as well that will feed directly into some choices uh, that we as part of our, our broader mobility plan. Madam President. Uh, yes, Mr. Gorman. <clears throat> so I, I wanted to um, to also thank Metro for being here and uh, and thank the county uh, for giving us such priority. Um, it, there really has been good teaming between uh, Renton and Metro, and I'm very appreciative of that. And, and I also did want to make sure you knew that, um, that as a council, we really are looking at where these investments are going to go, and we'll make sure that we, um, we do appropriate zoning and comprehensive plan changes to, to keep everything synced up. Um, we've already had it at some of our council offsites discussions about parking standards and how they get impacted by the availability of, of good public transit. And so we've got our eye on that and we'll, um, I think that this will give us opportunities to help the region-wide uh, housing shortages by, by getting people close to where these, um, these new um, uh, rapid ride stations are. So thank you for that and uh, I look forward to continuing to make sure we have a unified plan. I appreciate the proactiveness to, to come here and to have all the open houses in our community. Ms. Perez. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for the presentation. Two things. One, I highly appreciate the Metro Community Connection programs that um, to see what are the needs in the Benson Hill area, which is, which for us is really important. So I, I, I thank you for that. But the next question, and you were here in the previous presentation, is about your outreach. Uh, you explained that you want to serve the most underserved population, and you know our community is, is really diverse. And, uh, and one of the things that I have noticed in the past is that uh, the outreach of Met Metro is a lot online, and questionnaires and surveys online. And unfortunately, a lot of our community, especially the multicultural and multilingual um, uh, population, Sometimes they, they don't have access to, to this. So if we want to serve them, we need to be effective doing outreach to, to these populations. Any plans of how you're planning to reach um, our diverse community? Yeah, there's a few different ways I think that we're looking at doing that. And, and certainly, um, your point's well taken that you know out, outreach through online surveys is not always the best way to catch everyone's uh, you know, thoughts and opinions on, on any, any changes. Um, one way that we are looking for outreach, uh, um, doing outreach in this study area is partner, partnering with community-based organizations. And actually, Metro does have uh, the ability to compensate uh, community-based organizations for their, their sort of outreach work on our behalf. And so identifying those community organizations that we can partner with uh, there's also a couple different pieces to that. One is we'll have a broader sort of advisory board that we expect to have uh, representation from these community-based organizations on that advisory board that will help us at some of these concepts. Uh, in addition to that, we have our mobility board. Uh, you may have heard it called a sounding board in the past in other metro projects. Uh, but essentially, that's just a, a community or, or a citizen <coughs> advisory board, and we're going to be looking for 
uh, recommendations from these community-based organizations for folks that could participate on that panel uh, and, and really sort of reach voices that we might not traditionally uh, be able to reach uh, online and through other methods. Um, in addition, doing in-person and in-language um, outreach, so uh, working through Metro and, and working through other partners uh, and identifying opportunities to communicate in language uh, at existing events um, and, and really providing um, you know, opportunities to provide input beyond just the standard uh, open house format uh, where, we, where we expect people to come to us. Similar uh, to the previous presentation, looking for opportunities to um, <coughs> go to existing events, use uh, leverage sort of existing uh, communities and relationship uh, opportunities to, to connect uh, that way and really, really gather that feedback and not only gather that feedback, but um, really elevate that feedback in a way that places a priority on those underserved populations in the way that we uh, design our network concepts and evaluate uh, the impacts to any changes that we make. Now, I would just add that we are very interested in your feedback on how it's working. So we'll be working closely with staff here in Renton to understand um, really what can be effective and what has been effective for them, but we are open and eager for your feedback also. Um, where I feel, you know, I think there is a renewed or a new um, push on, a, on our agency's part. I hear it at this meeting tonight to just really double down on inclusive outreach and engagement. And I feel like we're all learning together a little bit about what works and doesn't work. So please tell us um, when things are working or aren't working. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So if there are no further questions, we'll adjourn the Committee of the Whole and reconvene here at 7 o'clock for the full council meeting. Thank you. Thanks.